We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? Well, today is going to be more of a lecture than a exposition. And my wife, again, last night as I was talking to her, saying, now, honey, please, try not to make it boring. Well, I'm going to give it my best shot, though some people do not believe that you can actually give a lecture and it not be boring. But hopefully uh, this will be the exception today. The title of my address, A Call for Faithful Exposition in Our Day. Uh, evangelicals and Southern Baptists have been greatly blessed in the last several decades. Uh, let's speak of Southern Baptists for a moment. Beginning in 1979, uh, which is clearly the inaugural date of the conservative resurgence, and going through the year 2000, which is when we adopted the Baptist faith and message, uh, there were a number of things that we hoped would take place. And I do believe that in many ways, one of the things that has occurred is something of a revival in expository preaching. Uh, because of technology and media, all of us have access to great men, both of the past and the present. In just the last few days, I just sat down and began to list the excellent expositors uh, that are out there that have influenced me, and perhaps I suspect many of you going back, men like W.A. Criswell, Adrian Rogers, Stephen Olford, Jerry Vines, John MacArthur, James Merritt, Alistair Begg, John Piper, David Jeremiah, J.D. Greer, Mark Dever, David Platt, Tony Morita, Lig Duncan, Sinclair Ferguson, Robert Smith, Jim Shattuck, Scott Pace, Josh and Steve Smith, David Allen, Stephen Rummage, H.B. Charles, Tim Keller, Andy Davis, Tony Evans, and my list is not exhaustive. And though all of those men have their own unique style of doing, preaching, and in particular, exposition, I think it would be quite easy to put all of them under the umbrella of a faithful expository preacher. And yet, I still have a concern for the necessity of authentic exposition in our day, because it still seems to me that voices from the purpose-driven world, the seeker-sensitive world, the emerging world are still having way too much influence in too many tribes within the evangelical and Baptist world. I think we would be foolish if we did not acknowledge the influence of people like Andy Stanley, Rick Warren, Stephen Furtick, Joel Osteen. In fact, on a couple of occasions over the last 10 years, I decided for whatever reason to go on a bombing raid on Joel Osteen from the pulpit, basically calling him out as the heretic that he is. And in both of those occasions, I was confronted immediately after my message by very angry persons one time in a seminary, uh, trying to understand why I would be critical of someone that gives people so much hope. And I said, well, the problem with uh, Mr. Osteen is that people come to his crusades and to his church lost and feeling bad. They hear him preach and they leave lost and feeling better. Which is worse? Which is the greater danger to one's spiritual health and vitality? And I do believe every generation will have to again and again and again hear the warning of Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. 
And again, I know it's one thing for those of us who are in the ministry in terms of how we think and how we look at things, but I want to tell you, if you take the time to listen carefully to the folks in your churches, uh, you may be disappointed at exactly where they are in their thinking. In fact, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that ours is a day when people are more familiar with the characters of Star Wars and Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, and the contestants of The Voice and Dancing with the Stars than they are with the men and women of Scripture. People are captivated by Facebook and Instagram posts, TikTok, and the latest gospel about Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift. It's disappointing when too many evangelicals and Southern Baptists walk the same path as the liberal and neo-orthodox of a previous error, whether they realize it or not. Claiming to believe in an infallible and inerrant Bible, too many pastors handle the Bible in a way that is sloppy and irresponsible, dishonest to the text, and actually a form of ministerial malpractice that they inflict upon their congregation. Further, at least implicitly, such preaching questions the judgment of God, the Holy Spirit, and inspiring Scripture as we have it both in its substance and its structure. Topical preaching, narrative preaching, emerging preaching, and yes, even some types of doctrinal preaching fundamentally suggest by their method and their practice that the Holy Spirit should have packaged the Bible differently. This, in my mind, is spiritually ignorant at best and arrogant at worst. Now, that raises a question that we must define. What do we mean by biblical exposition? And what are the essential components of this type of preaching? Now, it is often said that there are as many definitions of expository preaching as there are books on the subject. This statement, however, is simply not true on closer inspection. It ignores the fact that various definitions, though differing at particular points and terminology, are quite similar at the foundational level. And when we take an honest look, we discover that there actually exists a genuine consensus on what expository preaching is among those who write about it and those who practice it. Uh, Several years ago, I wrote a book along with uh, Stephen Rummage and Bill Curtis entitled Engaging Exposition. And out of that book, we developed a very short, a little bit more expanded, and then a description of what we believe expository preaching is. In terms of a very short definition, we simply said expository preaching is text-driven preaching. The text is the king, and it determines every aspect of how you handle your sermon. Uh, Stephen Roman suggested a slightly expanded definition, Christ-centered, text-driven, Spirit-led preaching that transforms lives. And then we came together with a expanded kind of description of it. And this is going to be something I will expand off of through the remainder of my time this morning. Expository preaching is text-driven preaching that honors the truth of Scripture in substance and structure as it was given by the Holy Spirit. Discovering the God-inspired meaning through historical grammatical, theological, Christological investigation and interpretation of the preacher by means of engaging and compelling proclamation, explains, illustrates, and applies the meaning of the biblical text in submission to and in the power of the Holy Spirit preaching Christ for a verdict of changed lives. Now, out of this description, I want to put before you this morning what I believe are seven essentials Seven mandates, if you like, for what it is that true, authentic, expository preaching always entails. And I'll speak quickly and watch our time. Number one, preaching must be text-driven so that it honors the Bible as divine revelation. Article 25 of the Chicago Statement on Hermeneutics states, We affirm that the only type of preaching which sufficiently conveys the divine revelation and its proper application to life is that which faithfully expounds the text of Scripture as the Word of God. We deny that the preacher has any message from God apart from the text 
of Scripture. In other words, authentic expository preaching allows the Scriptures as divine revelation to determine both the substance and the structure of the message. It believes the Bible is inerrant and infallible and treats it as inerrant and infallible. Indeed, how one structures the Scriptures should determine how one structures the sermon. Good hermeneutics is foundational to good homiletics. The scriptural text drives and determines, shapes and forms sermon development as it relates to the explanation of the biblical text. I think Sidney Gradanis is exactly right. Biblical preaching, expository preaching, is a Bible-shaped word imparted in a Bible-like way. In expository preaching, the biblical text is neither a conventional introduction to a sermon on a largely different theme, nor a convenient convenient peg on which one hangs a rag bag of miscellaneous thoughts, but rather it is a master which dictates and controls what is said. That is why when I teach preaching, I encourage my students to take the Bible as it is and preach it book by book, chapter by chapter, phrase by phrase, word by word, and let the Bible set the agenda. Alan Ross of Beeson Divinity School, though, though concurring with Gradanus, adds an important warning that many who profess to be expositors, but in practice actually are not, desperately need to hear. And listen very carefully to what Dr. Ross says. Quote, Too many so-called expositors simply make one central idea the substance of their message. The narrative may be read or retold, but the sermon is essentially their central expository idea. It is explained, it is illustrated, it is applied, but it is done so without any further recourse to the text. This approach is not valid exegetical exposition. In exegetical exposition, the substance of the exposition must be clearly derived from the text so that the central idea unfolds in the analysis of the passage and so that all parts of the passage may be interpreted to show their contribution to the theological idea. In other words, a faithful expositor will reject any method that would entice him to superimpose his preconceived agenda on the text. He will not use the text as a springboard to be creative and entertaining. The faithful expositor will make sure that his people hear the message of God who inspired the text and is in the text. But sadly, in our therapeutic culture, where felt needs and how-to sermons often dominate, text-driven preaching is viewed as simply inadequate and even by some antiquated. It is certainly deemed as being out of touch. On more than one occasion, I've had a church planter or a large church pastor actually tell me, you cannot build a church in our context on expository preaching. Indeed, the perspective of too many is expressed well in an article entitled, What is the Matter with Preaching? And listen to what this particular individual wrote. Quote, every sermon should have for its main business the solving of some problem, a vital, important problem, puzzling minds, burdening consciences, and distracting lives. And if any preacher is not doing this, even though he has at his disposal both erudition and oratory, he is not functioning at all. Many preachers, for example, indulge habitually in what they call expository sermons. They take a passage from Scripture. And they proceeding on the assumption that the people attending church that morning are deeply concerned about what the passage means, they spend their half hour or more on historical exposition of the verse or chapter, ending with some appended practical application to their listeners. Could any procedure be more surely predestined to dullness and futility? Who seriously supposes that as a matter of fact, one in a hundred of the congregation cares to start with what Moses or Isaiah, Paul, or John meant in those special verses or came to church deeply concerned about it. Nobody else who talks to the public so assumes 
that the vital interests of the people are located in the meaning of words spoken 2,000 years ago. The advertisers of any goods, from a five-foot shelf of classic books to the latest life insurance policy, plunge as directly as possible after the contemporary wants, felt needs, actual interest, and concerns. Preachers who pick out texts from the Bible and then proceed to give their historical setting, their logical meaning in the context, their place in the theology of the writer, are grossly misusing the Bible. Let them not end, but start with thinking of the audience's vital needs, and then let the whole sermon be organized around their endeavor to meet those needs. This is all good sense and psychology. And interestingly, that statement does not come from a contemporary pulpiteer. Its author was the liberal pastor Harry Emerson Fosdick, who wrote it back in 1928. I would submit this morning that many contemporary evangelicals need to be careful as to which homiletical stream they are drinking. Number two. Preaching must honor the principle of a thorough intent, recognizing that the ultimate author of Scripture is the Holy Spirit of God. The faithful expositor humbly recognizes that when he stands to preach, he stands to preach what has been given by the Holy Spirit of God. He understands that what he has before his eyes is divinely inspired by God, and he trembles at the very thought of abusing neglecting or altering what God himself has written. John Stott said it very well. We should never presume to occupy a pulpit unless we believe in this God, the God of the Bible. How dare we speak if God has not spoken? By ourselves, we have nothing to say. But once we are persuaded that God has spoken, however, then we too must speak. I believe, as I've said for most of my ministry, that the Bible is best described as the Word of God written in the words of men. However, we must never forget it is ultimately the Word of God and the divine author's intended meaning as deposited in the text should be honored. There's a very noble tradition concerning this principle. J.I. Packer himself citing the Westminster Dictionary of 1645, captures well what it states, quote, the true idea of preaching is that the preacher should become a mouthpiece for his text, opening it up, applying it as a word from God to his hearers, talking only in order that the text may speak itself and be heard, making each point from his text in such a manner that hearers may discern the very voice of God. Charles Spurgeon would add in this context, quote, a sermon comes with far greater power to the consciousness, consciences of the hearers when it is plainly the very word of God. Not a lecture about the scripture, but scripture itself opened up and enforced. I will further recommend to you to hold to the ipsissima verb of the very words of the Holy Ghost. Those sermons which expound the exact words of the Holy Spirit are the most useful and the most agreeable to the major part of our congregations. They love to have the words themselves explained and expounded. And I'll say this just very quickly. You may be in a church where that's not where they are now. But if you faithfully week after week and month after month and year after year continue to faithfully expound the word of God, they will not be able to put up with anything else. And they will crave to find a church when they move on, if God leads them somewhere else, to find another man who faithfully week after week just simply opens up and explains the word of God. Haddon Robinson is exactly right. When a preacher fails to preach the scriptures, he abandons his authority. He now confronts his hearers no longer with a word from God, but only with another word from men. And bottom line, brothers, I don't give a rip what you think. I don't give a rip what I think. But I care greatly about what God thinks. 
And that is what faithful expositors will be sure to give their people. Number three, Scripture must be interpreted and understood as it was given to the original audience. The text cannot mean today what it did not mean then. However, now stay with me, it may reveal a more full meaning in the context of the whole canon and what I love to call the rest of the story. Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart are certainly correct in their classic book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. A text cannot mean what it never could have meant to its author or his readers. In other words, the author and the original audience hearing us expound the text should be able to step up and exclaim, you got it right. You got it right. Now, this principle does not neglect the fact that the faithful expositor must build a sturdy bridge between the historical audience and their context, the wonderful contribution again of John Stott, the audience he addresses here and now. It does mean, though, he will not eisegete the text, reading into it the preconceived notions of his own imagination or interests. Further, he will not abuse the inspired text with a fanciful and irresponsible hermeneutic that surpasses the allegorist of the medieval period. As evangelical expositors, we must continue to affirm that the meaning is one, though the applications are many. We must honor the text as it was given and as it would have been understood by the original audience. However, and this is crucially important, this principle does not ignore the divine authorship of Scripture, the concept of interpreting Scripture in light of the whole canon, the flow and nature of redemptive history, and its Christological focus. And that's a lecture in and of itself. It does see the value of what theologians call census plenary. As Kevin Van Huser argues, and I find his argument compelling, quote, the fuller meaning of Scripture, the meaning associated with divine authorship, will emerge only at the level of the whole canon. The canon as a whole becomes the unified act for which the divine intention serves as the unifying principle. The divine intention supervenes on the intention of the human authors. The Spirit will apply meaning. He will not change it. In other words, implications and significances embedded in the meaning of the text in light of the whole canon of the coming of Christ, may certainly come to light. This will provide balance as well as a healthy affirmation of the principle of progressive revelation. It will recognize that knowing, quote, the rest of the story, close quote, should inform our interpretation and proclamation. I will address this more fully with principle number five. Number four. Pulpit proclamation must affirm that the historical, grammatical, theological, Christological interpretation will best discover both the truth of the text and the theology of the text as well. Recent years have felt like an excursion into something of a religious twilight zone for me. Restless and reformed, wokeism, politics, gender confusion, Rick Warren, Andy Stanley, and the beat goes on. Question, which of these is the real danger? Answer, none of them. None of them as troubling as some of these movements and personalities are. No, I am more convinced the real danger is being swallowed whole by shallow and sloppy and unbalanced theologies. If we will indeed teach our people solid biblical theology rooted in biblical exposition. Extreme agendas from any direction will be easily recognized and quickly jettisoned. Walt Kaiser correctly reminds us, quote, the discipline of biblical theology must be a twin of exegesis. Exegetical theology will remain incomplete and virtually barren in its results as far as the church is concerned, without a proper input of informing theology, a proper input of systematic theology. Indeed, Donald Blesch, I believe, is correct. The church that does not take theology seriously is unwittingly encouraging understanding of the faith 
that are both warped or unbalanced. That's why, again, when I teach preaching, I encourage my students when they are dealing with a particular text to follow the classic categories of theology and ask the question, does this text, and if so, how does it speak to the doctrine of God, the doctrine of revelation, the doctrine of humanity, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of the church, and the doctrine of eschatology are last things. To simplify it, I say, always ask of a text, what does this text teach us about God? What does this text teach us about fallen humanity? How does this text point to Christ? What does God want my people to know? And what does God want my people to do? And in this context, let me say, this is a great area to take advantage of the great hymns of the faith, as well as the great confessions of the faith as well. I could say a lot more, but I need to move on. Number five, effective biblical instruction will take seriously and develop the implications of what Jesus said in Luke 24 and in John 5, 39 about the Christological nature of Scripture. Further, it will pay attention to the sermons of the apostles in Acts and the writer of the book of Hebrews. Call it what you will. Preaching that does not exalt, magnify, and glorify the Lord Jesus is not Christian preaching. Preaching that does not present the gospel and call men and women to repent of sin and place their faith in the death and resurrect of Jesus Christ is not gospel preaching. This includes how we handle and preach the Old Testament as well as the New. Brothers and sisters, we do not handle the Old Testament like Jewish rabbis. All of Scripture is Christian, or if you prefer, all of Scripture is Messianic Scripture. Good and faithful exposition will always honor the historical grammatical hermeneutic, but it will also be Christological in focus, intercanonical in context, and intertextual in building a biblical theology. It will carefully interpret Scripture in the greater context of the grand redemptive storyline of the Bible. The near and immediate context will be honored, but so will the extended and canonical context as well. Such a hermeneutic and homiletic is in harmony with that which was employed by the apostles, applying what uh, can be called a comprehensive Christocentric hermeneutic. We will examine the little narratives and pericopes in light of the big narrative, the great redemptive narrative centered in Christ. And I would just quickly add as an aside, I think Genesis 3.15 is a very important hermeneutical key in rightly interpreting the Old Testament. As this applies then to the Old Testament, we will exegete and expound Scripture, recognizing that all of the Scripture points to Christ. And as those in Christ, it points to us and is applied to us, mediated through Christ. And again, it's another sermon, another address for another day. Faithful typology not fanciful allegory, will be a helpful and important hermeneutical key that will unlock messianic jewels often neglected or missed. John Aiken, who does happen to be my son, professor of Old Testament Hebrew at Carson Newman, guides us well when he writes, and I quote, We look for clues, themes, etc., that foreshadow what will happen at the end of the story. After reading the whole story... Those clues and themes now make greater sense and are read in the light of the rest of the story. When reading stories like Romeo and Juliet, The Odyssey, or The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we do not dissect the earlier episodes without putting them in the context of the entire story. That would be like analyzing Act 2 of Romeo and Juliet without seeing the clues and themes that foreshadow the tragic movement of the plot. The same must be done when reading the Old Testament because there are clues and themes. These point forward to fulfillment in Christ. Now, in this regard, I put my cards on the table. I have been influenced by, and I stand with expositors like John Aiken, Don Carson, Brian Chappell, Edmund Clowney, Sinclair Ferguson, Lig Duncan, Graham Goldsworthy, Sidney Gradanis, Tim Keller, Tony Morita, Dwayne Milioni, David Platt, Adrian Rogers, Jim Shaddix, 
Jerry Vines, Charles Spurgeon, and in particular, I have been significantly influenced by the preaching ministry of the Presbyterian, Tim Keller. Many of you are familiar with his wonderful article entitled, It's All About Jesus. It does such a wonderful job of helping us understand the overarching way that we ought to be approaching the Old Testament. He says, and I quote, Jesus is the true and better Adam. He passed the test in the wilderness, not in the garden, and his obedience is imputed to us. Jesus is the true and better Abel, who though innocently slain by wicked hands, has blood now that cries out, not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. Jesus is the better ark of Noah, who carries us safely through the wrath of God revealed from heaven and delivers us to a new earth. Jesus is the true and better Abraham, who answered the call of God to leave all that is comfortable and familiar and go out into a foreign land and create a new people of God. Jesus is the true and better Isaac, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us. And when God said to Abraham, now I know you love me because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from me. Now we can look at God taking his son up the mountain of Calvary, sacrificing him and say, now we know that you love us because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from us. Jesus is the true invader Jacob who wrestled and took the blows of justice we deserved. So we, like Jacob, only received the wounds of grace to wake us up and to discipline us. Jesus is the true and better Joseph, who at the right hand of the king forgives those who betrayed him and sold him and uses his new power to save them. He is the true and better Moses, who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. He is the true and better rock of Moses, who struck with the rod of God's justice, now gives us living water in the desert. He is the true and better Joshua who leads us into a land of eternal rest and heavenly blessing. Jesus is the better ark of the covenant and perhaps my favorite. He is the true and better Job. He truly is the innocent sufferer who then intercedes for and saves his stupid friends. He is the true and better David, the true and better Esther the true and better Daniel, having been lowered into a lion's den of death, but emerging early, and the text is so clear, the next morning is alive and vindicated by our God. He is the true and better Jonah. He is the real Passover lamb, innocent, perfect, helpless, slain, so that the angel of death will pass over us. He is the true temple. He is the true and greater prophet the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, the true bread. The Bible is really all about him. It is not about us. And quoting the name associated with your college and that magnificent library, Charles Spurgeon, leave Christ out. Oh, my brethren, better to leave the pulpit out altogether. If a man can preach one sermon without mentioning Christ's name in it, it ought to be his last. Certainly the last that any Christian ought to go to hear him preach. And again, no Christ in your sermon, sir, then go home and never preach again until you have something worth saying. Very quickly, my last two points, number six and seven, from beginning to end, from the study to the pulpit, The entire process of biblical exposition must take place in absolute and complete submission to the Holy Spirit. I did not realize it, so let me just digress for a moment and and summarize time-wise. I didn't realize what he meant years ago when I heard W.A. Crystal ask the question, Dr. Crystal, when do you have your devotion? Dr. Crystal responded, what I do in the study every day is my devotion. Now, at first I thought, well, that's a... uh, cheap way of begging out your responsibility. Why don't you just go ahead and admit it, you don't have a devotion. But then I began to think about it, and you know what I came to understand? What you do in the study ought to be devotional. What you do in the study ought to be worship. And I want to tell you something. It transforms that study into a holy place. This, this is me. Not necessarily how you would do it, but when I go to the study to prepare a message... I get on my knees and I say to the Lord, Lord, 
I want to hear you speak to me today as I read your word, as I try to work through the Hebrew or Greek text, as I read commentaries and, and Bible dictionaries. And Lord, if nobody gets anything out of this but me, that'll be okay. And then I play Christian music in the background as I work through the various sort resources to put my messages together. And I'm going to tell you something. When I come out of there, I'm not tired. I'm not fatigued. I'm energized. I can't wait to get back and be with my Lord again in that study that has become a holy place because I've allowed it to become a place of worship, all of it taking place under the watchful eye of God's Holy Spirit. Just give it a thought and see if maybe the Lord does something like that for you as well. Finally, number seven, change lives for the glory of God is always the goal for which we strive. Therefore, it is probably a sin to preach the Word of God in a boring and unattractive fashion. I agree with Charles Kohler who said, quote, it is more important clumsily to have something to say than cleverly to say nothing. The author of Ecclesiastes, the preacher, said in Ecclesiastes 12, 9, and 10, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, and he pondered, searching out and arranging many sayings, the preacher sought to, to, sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. Now listen to me. Listen to me. I'm on your side. In a multimedia, entertainment-saturated culture in which we live, I repeatedly tell my students, your people do not have to listen to bad preaching, and they don't. There is a plethora of podcasts out there that you can listen to and you never have to listen to a bad sermon, all right? As a result of that, I challenge them to keep this in mind. What you say is more important than how you say it. But how you say it has never been more important. Now, let me say that again. What you say is more important than how you say it. But how you say it has never been more important. I think Chuck Swindoll, who was for many years the uh, president of Dallas Theological Seminary and the main voice of Insight for a Living, got it exactly right when he said, and I quote, if you think the gathering of biblical facts and standing up with a Bible in your hand will automatically equip you to communicate well, you are deeply mistaken. It will not. You must work at being interesting. Boredom is a gross violation. Being dull is a grave offense. And irreverence is a disgrace to the gospel. Too often, these three crimes go unpunished. And we preachers are the criminals. Preaching is not as simple as dumping a half-ton load of religious wine and a hodgepodge of verbs and nouns and adjectives. No. It is preparing the heart, sharpening the mind, and delivering the goods with care, sensitivity, timing, and clarity. It is the difference between slopping hogs and feeding sheep. Therefore, study hard, pray like mad, think it through, tell the truth, then stand tall. But while you're on your feet, do not clothe the riches of Christ in rags. Say it well. And Martin Lloyd-Jones Lloyd would agree with that assessment when he writes... What is preaching? Logic on fire, eloquent reason. Are these contradictions? Of course they are not. A theology which does not take fire, I maintain, is a defective theology, or at least the man's understanding of it is defective. Preaching is theology coming through a man who is on fire. I say again that a man who speaks about these things dispassionately has no right whatsoever to be in a pulpit, and should never be allowed to enter into one ever again. Brothers and sisters, I close with this statement from Martin Luther, found in a treatise on Christian liberty, where he indeed, I think, throws down the gauntlet and gives us final words to indeed instruct us and hopefully inspire us in this noble task to which God has called us. Luther said, Let us then consider it certain and conclusively established that the soul can do without all things except the Word of God, and that where this is not, there is no help for the soul in anything else whatever. 
But if it has the word, it is rich, and it lacks nothing, since this word is the word of life, of truth, of light, of peace, of righteousness, of salvation, of joy, of liberty, of wisdom, of power, of grace, of glory, and of every blessing beyond our power to estimate. And I believe in a room like this, to Luther's words, we can all voice a hearty amen and amen. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, this morning that uh, I have said some things that would be helpful to the brothers and sisters who are here. And I help, Lord, once more, beginning with Danny Aiken, that we would be reminded of the awesome, holy assignment that is ours to preach the Word. And Lord, we need to preach the Word, not our thoughts, not our ideas. I did not mean to be ugly, but Lord, I really don't care what anybody else thinks, including me but I care dearly and greatly about what you think. And therefore, Lord, I want to make sure I rightly divide the word for me. But Lord, I also want to make sure I rightly divide the word for the people that you bring under my teaching ministry. God, you have spoken. Therefore, we too must speak. And Lord, we speak from where you have spoken, your infallible and inerrant word. May we be faithful to that assignment all the days of our lives. We ask this and we pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.